Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Boxing Report. I'm your host, Michael. After uh, taking a couple weeks off, I want to observe the holiday, uh, July 4th holiday, uh, for those who celebrated. And I had to deal with some personal matters on my end. We're back. Um, joining me this week, Gail from Communities Digital News, uh, Daniel from The Inscriber. Uh, what's going on, lady and gent? We're here. We're catching up. And there's lots to talk about. Indeed, indeed. Uh, for those who are new to Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report, live YouTube show, uh, podcast, uh, and blog discussing all things boxing. The motto is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is if it concerns the sweet science, we will talk about it. Um, if you want to find out all the information for the time being, the blog page is the place to go to, P4P Box Report dot wordpress.com. That's the link you check the top right of the blog page. You will find you will see where to find us all over uh, social media, uh, where to find us on RSS feeds that carry out and distribute podcasts on places like iTunes and Spotify and whatnot, uh, where you can donate. Got a Cash Me and PayPal donation link on the blog page. And last but certainly not least, link to my online fitness page. I am a coach for Beachbody um, online, BOD. As I said, because of my hectic some hectic stuff that's been going on on my end, uh, personal matters. Um, I had been doing my fitness challenges, but I'm going to start that back up for August. Um, wink, wink, nod, nod, uh, Daniel and Gail. Uh, so if you're interested in some fun uh, fitness challenges, if you're interested in any of the programs on um, Beachbody.com uh, or Beachbody On Demand specifically, uh, check out my online coaching page on Pound for Pound Block. Pound for Pound Box Report blog page. Uh, let's get things going this evening by recapping some fights, uh, starting back uh, where we left off a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, let's start with, ladies first, of course, Gil. Let's start with uh, Jose Pedraza, who uh, before, uh, the week of our last show was set to fight uh, Miguel Lespier. Uh, the question I had was, Gail, when we previewed the fight was if Pedraza uh, could handle the size of Les Pierre, uh, because this fight took place at 140 pounds, I thought he could out, outbox Les Pierre, and he did that. I think there was both fighters got knocked down, uh, but in the end, um, Pedraza did enough to win and win uh, fairly impressively. Um, I know it's been a few weeks uh, since that last fight, but if you can recollect, uh, your thoughts on the fight and your thoughts on Pedraza and how you look. Oh, yeah, I can recollect very well. I, honestly, I thought this might, might just, might be a little bit more even of a fight. It, it didn't really turn out to be. Um, you know, uh, Pedraza showed, you know, the effects of some of his um, new training, which was a positive. Um, but he, but, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't quite, um, you know, the, the war we were hoping for, we were hoping, you know, Le Pierre had uh, recovered and found himself after being absolutely drubbed by Maurice Hooker. I mean, it was a horrible loss. You know, it seemed like he'd recovered, he'd gotten a second wind and uh, it di just didn't happen. Now, Pedraza did originally get called as being knocked down, but it got overruled. It was a trip and it was a very odd ruling in the middle of the fight um, because uh, originally Kenny Bayless called it a knockdown. And due to the camera angle we were seeing at home, it did look like a knockdown, but clearly at ringside, the judges in the, and they had a replay referee on board who spotted the fact that uh, Lapierre had stepped on Pedraza's foot uh, while he was landing a punch with Pedraza already off balance, but he didn't really land much of anything and he, and he goes down. Action stops. I mean, just stops right at the beginning of the sixth round, the round after which the knockdown occurred. So that the refer replay referee, oh, by the way, who was Robert Byrd, uh, waves over Bayless. They take a look. 
Now, Bayless is the one who has the sole discretion to either wave it off, reverse his knockdown, or not. He did reverse the knockdown. It was the right thing to do, but it was kind of troublesome timing. Um, it put a lot of a pause in the action. Um, it gave Le Pierre a second win because he he was getting hammered, you know, pretty badly. Um, so it, it probably allowed him to finish the fight. Um, I'm not necessarily thinking that was you know the greatest thing. I think Pedraza probably could have finished him off, but you know the truth is no matter. And, and in these pandemic fights, you know our expectations are are very very different. Um, Le Pierre is a frontline healthcare worker outside the ring. Great guy. Um, you know, waited for his opportunity for this fight after positive COVID tests delayed it. You know, part of me is glad he ended the fight on his feet. I'm not sure where he goes from here. You know, I'm not even sure what his gatekeeper status might be. You know, Pedraza was very dominant in the win, not a stoppage. You know, clearly he's back in business. Where where he goes from here, you know, against bigger name opponents remains to be seen. There's just so much about all these guys that's in question right now, depending on what the boxing schedule is, you know, who's available, travel issues, who knows. But Pedraza did his job. He looked good. He got through it. Finally, COVID, COVID test delayed at all. Um, I'll go to you, Daniel, and kind of uh, the question to you is kind of uh, uh, extends off of what the, of what Gail just said. Uh, she kind of raised a, a dilemma for Pedraza uh, post this fight. Uh, sure, if you want to talk about the fight itself, sure. But the question I have for you is, Given the context of how the sport is operating right now, um, COVID-19, coronavirus pandemic still ongoing, um, there's still issues across the country. Um, simply put, where does Pedraza go from here? Uh, well, first, as far as the fight, Uh, we have to as we reread. I know it was the first time we actually saw it in practice, but the reprint process has to be worked out a lot better than this than what's happened. Especially when the replay did the wrong result. That was a knockdown, as far as I'm concerned, in that area. But Pedraza did his job, ended earlier. But he did his job, he did it was supposed to do he made major part he also showed that if you don't have a lot of power in that division you can still get chin checked so as far as when he goes into the future that makes it what's difficult because would you honestly put him against Ivor Varanchik Jose Ramirez you have Victor Posta right now would you able would you put him against any of those guys and say he will be able to take their punch. No. I not right now, can't no. say it. The problem is that you really, really have to snap. Yeah. The pro problem with the whole situation is we don't really know what the because Nevada is unfortunately one of the states that is starting to see a rise is in being infected with this virus. And when you have that going along, along with the majority of the country, a lot of these guys live being really higher up. It really puts a dent in with this because we mentioned a couple, there was a couple of other fights too that have happened. that we should have seen some other fights, but the virus always keeps involving into it. There isn't much he can do at this stage. But what that kindles up is more time to look at who in the division he can look better against. 
when it comes into uh, the guys I mentioned. Yeah, I wouldn't put him in the ring against any. But looking at some of the second tier guys, maybe third tier guys, you into it, and it can work out at that point. And not to mention the fact that you know he he did pretty well considering the circumstances against Lomachenko. If Lomachenko to 140, I wouldn't mind seeing that fight again because Pedraza did give him a really good fight. And I meant to say it, Pedraza's naturally bigger than Loma. So what happens now when it's an even bigger advantage when it's the best? Somebody in Loma who may not, who may have hit the plateau at lightweight. It's a half, but unfortunately, the entire situation puts a whole screw into everything. The problem with the a proposition of him fighting uh, Lomachenko at 140, I don't think Loma was going up above 135. Uh, shoot, if there was a big fight at 130 pounds, he would move back down there, no problem. Uh, and, and when you look at the 140-pound landscape, I agree with you. I wouldn't put him in there with a Ramirez. I wouldn't put him in there with a, 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 a Taylor or a, a Postal, um, Baranchik, uh, fighters of that nature. Um, even someone like a Jack Catterall, who I'm uh, myself and um, the rest of the fellows over there at Three Kings Boxing uh, where I write for, we're very impressed with him. We uh, we like his swag. We like his attitude. And he can fight, fight better than people uh, give him credit for. Uh, so nice win. He's there. But the, the, the cloud that remains over here, for lack of a better word, is you just don't know where's the next move. Uh, uh, he's in a precarious, uh, tricky uh, position. Um, and even if he was to move back down to 135, uh, who would give him the opportunity? Not because, not based on the fact that he's too good or too tough for his own good, but at this stage of his career, would it even be worth it if he was to say move back down to 135? There's no money in there to fight him. So uh, it's a wait and see uh, uh, where he goes. Uh, um, at this point and at this uh, stage um, of his career. Let's move on to other fights here uh, uh, on the docket. Uh, only three fights on the docket this week. Um, Alex Salcedo, and I'll go back to you, Daniel. It's interesting. He he had that fight of the year, uh, candid, fight of the year, arguable fight of the year, uh, candidate for fight of the year in 2018 against um, uh, uh, Lenny Z. Um, he followed that up with the fight against Hooker, where a lot of people, excuse me, a lot of people anticipated him to win. Um, excuse me, uh, phone is ringing. My apologies for that. Um, a lot of people anticipated him to win against Maurice Hooker. He was the favorite fighting in his hometown. But uh, after knocking down Hooker early, um, he Hooker came on and eventually stopped him. A lot of questions about his defense. Uh, he fought um, Sonny Fredrickson, won by wide mar margin on the scorecards, uh, virtually won every round across the board. But the question remains, Daniel, yes, he won, but did you see significant enough improvement to say, well, yeah, you can put him right back in the title hunt at 140 pounds? No. Flat out, if anything, he's rest a little bit. And it's that not through fault of his own. It's just the whole situation has not given people the run not only the run amount of time to train, the proper sparring partners to train with. So he was supposed to do. He won handily. There was no debate over who won, but he didn't show enough to where I can put him back into that picture. Now, he may be an opponent, actually. We talked about it. 
it may be an opponent for Pedraza, actually. Somebody that can go in, give you a really, really good fight if you give him a chance. And like I said, very skilled, very slick. That could be the fight that you can see where the measuring stick for either guy. With Pedraza's power of 140 pounds, and what Salcedo is, when you can fight somebody with that much skill, so that you don't have to rely all on just going all blood and guts a lot of times to get things done. So he did enough to win. I can't, but maybe, like I said, the, the last two people we talked about, maybe they're probably the ideal dance partners. You asked Gail when we when we just talked about the previous fight with uh, Pedraza, where does he go from here? The same question could be asked of Salcedo, uh, where does he go from here? Uh, and did you see enough improvement where you can put him in, where you can say uh, maybe he can get another shot at a world title? At this point, he could probably get it because of his name status and who's backing him. But in terms of what and who he is as a fighter, I will see the same problems for him that, 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 that showed itself against um, Hooker. I, I just don't see him right now uh, competing um, with the elite in the division. Yeah, I agree. In a regular, perfect boxing world, again, we're in the pandemic universe. The pandemic gets a say, and it limits the potential for opponents. So assuming we're going to go through at least a couple of months of, you know, shut down bubble type atmosphere, no fans, distanced fights. It's a lot easier. It makes a lot more sense for top rank to keep their opposition matchups in house. They seem to reward guys willing to get up and fight right now. You know, they're handing them all the business they can, you know, so that, so you're right. It was a Pedraza Salcedo fight ideal. Really? No, but they do match up. Well, they are both coming off wins. They're both in the bubble. They both agreed to play on this particular platform and playground. So I, I think, you know, unless I'm, pretty surprised by somebody else coming into the picture, I think it's likely to happen. And if it's a reward for these guys, particularly, you know, Salcedo is the B-side for, you know, being willing to take fights under the conditions they do, I'm, I will not hate on that. I won't. Let's move on to talk about uh, um, a fight that took place uh, uh, last week. Um, as we had said uh, a couple of shows back, um, the date last week, which was the the other fight, which was scheduled to be the 14th, that was supposed to be Jamel Herring title defense, but he uh, tested positive for uh, COVID-19. Um, he has, uh, I think, subsequent tested positive for a second time, unfortunately, on him's part. So we uh, wish him the best and got to find out what situation is happening with you, bro, that you tested him twice for COVID-19 back to back. That's worrisome. Um, but anyway, the fight... That main event was replaced by Michaela Mayer, who's a, a, a rising, a very good uh, a women's fighter um, in the junior lightweight division. She fought um, Helen Joseph. And I go to you, Gail. Now, admittedly, Joseph is the smaller fighter. However, um, Michaela Mayer, uh, she dominated. Uh, she looked very good doing so. Slick, skilled, uh, uh, high level skill. Um, one by decision wipeout, easy work for her all night long. She said that she, it wasn't her best performance. <laughs> at the same time, she was kind of offended at the guys at ESPN who dare suggest that Joseph would give her a tough fight. But the bottom line for me is after watching this fight, she's ready. Um, she's ready for a world title shot. Uh, your thoughts on what you saw from uh, Mayor against Joseph? Me personally, uh, um, 
I'm 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 very impressed. I'm very impressed. Very impressed. Think about it, Michael. How many other women's professional boxers can you legitimately call slick in the ring? Slick. You can call them, um, you know, hard workers. Can take a punch. You know, um, tough, um, speed, nimble, but slick. That's a word you could apply to Mary Q. You absolutely can apply it to Michaela Miller. You know, she's come off the same, you know, layoff, rust, access to gym problems everybody else has. And you would never have known it. She improves fight after fight after fight. And she didn't even have her trainer um, with her because her trainer is 76 years old, Al Mitchell, out of Philly. He stayed home. Um, due to a previous positive COVID test he had, he let Kate Coroma and Manny Robles hold down the corner um, and told her, listen to them. <laughs> but he had given them a good talking to. And the truth is, she doesn't need a whole lot of guidance in the ring. Helen Joseph, you know, she fought a determined fight. She came up in weight to take this fight. Michaela Mayer is much bigger, much taller a lot more reach, you know, she was handicapped, you know, with a virtual hand behind her back from the start, but she stood tough. She stood right in front of her. She didn't run. Joseph can take a punch. I, you know, that, that will not win you a fight, but it will keep you in sometimes. And, you know, the truth is her corner could have pulled her, you know, frankly, anytime after about the seventh round, it was very obvious she wanted to end on her feet and she did end on her feet and i will give her all the credit in the world for that and top rank should reward her with another fight now let's move on to mayor's future mayor made it very clear she has talked to grandpa bob she wants a title fight and video floated around after the fight uh, card showing mayor having a phone conversation with bob arum um after and it, he very clearly congratulates her, says great fight, and promises her her next fight will be for the title. And Mayor said, I'm absolutely going to hold him to it. She could really take on anybody, anybody with a belt. And the truth is, I'm not sure she could come down a division if she, I don't think she needs to. I do think she could go up a division, which is interesting, but maybe not, not at the moment. Yeah, she's ready to go. She wipes out anybody, as far as I'm concerned. She's just, she's not only skilled and slick, as we've said, you know, she's got the steely mental attitude. She's absolutely 100% confident. She comes in knowing she's going to win, and she does win. And that has a lot. Huh. And you're right. She got really up in Bernardo Osuna's grill saying, I'm, I'm a little offended. You thought this would be my toughest take test to date. Come on. And then she said, you know, she still has a lot to show, but she then went on to say in the first round, I knew she was too slow for me. It's all, that's all it wrote. Indeed. Um, after the fight, um, I said, I would love to see her, in the ring with uh, 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 Terry Harper, who has the WBC belt at 130 pounds. Harper is going to fight uh, Natasha Jonas uh, next month, April 7th, I believe, uh, uh, in England. Um, Harper, I believe, I think long term, um, they're trying to position her to fight Katie Taylor. However, uh, Daniel, a Harper mayor fight at 130 pounds would be assuming that mayor defeats natasha jonas and i think she will a harper mayor fight at 130 pounds that would be one of the best fights in women's boxing regardless of division i see that fight i smell that fight i want that fight We should get that fight, hopefully. This was... Okay, when you see it in... 
a test of Michaela Mayer as far as power, as far as speed. It also was a little bit of a test of her patience. Because actually one of the are one of the main observations that you see, I think I think it was Andre Ward when he talked about it during, I think it was in the second round, about his last hit the fight in the final Super Six with Carl Frost. And how he had to adjust to how Carl Frost was. And he compared that to what Mayer was, was seeing right now. So he had to, that Mayer had to folk had to adjust to how slow her. And he could tell too, and you could tell that this really tested and it did a good way. McClellan Mayer's patience. As you could feel like this is the big test. You're granted any circumstances whatsoever, but you're now headlining an ESPN card. <clears throat> you want to show out. You could easily try to make him make a mistake and try to go go for the knockout early. But she stayed patient. She stuck to the game plan. Attacked to the body. Set up the jabs, the shots to the head. Pretty much a fight where if a judge gave a person one round, that judge would never judge again. And herself, yes, that the kid is ready for a title shot. And the one I want her to to do it at 135 pounds. I can't. She's right now in that point where she could probably go down to fend the weight, but you definitely could see her going down, oh, sorry, going up to lightweight in the future in about maybe one and a half to two years. So, going to hurt to actually be a good way to go, especially now when, well, unfortunately, we're not hearing much of Clarissa. Shields. Uh, Cecilia Brackis, like we mentioned, that she's unfortunately she's not a household American name. And I'm on the, we know what the mess involved that with Katie Taylor. This, this is the perfect fight for somebody like Michaela to step in and try to become one of the faces, not the face as far as lighter divisions in women's boxing. This is her opportunity. Indeed. Um, the time is right for her. Um, excellent showcase performance. Um, not only the way she fought, but she has a bit of personality. I like her swag. Uh, uh, hopefully, Aram does the right thing. Aram, Aram uses her as like a vehicle, a platform in terms of, uh, of of women's boxing, feature her on more cards because uh, uh, she got it potential. Uh, uh, she got star potential. And even if it's not uh, uh, Harper, the fight that I like to see, um, the other champions at, at, at 130 pounds, uh, the names escapes me right now. Give me a quick second. Um, oh, the other, the other champions at 130? Uh, the French lady. Yeah, uh, uh. So they are not, they are for sure not household names. <laughs> You've got uh, the, uh, the WBO champ is Ava Brodnicka, who is, and undefeated, the French who is undefeated and the, 19 and 0, yeah. Malva Amadouche. That's and, what I'm thinking of, Malva and, then, and you have a South Korean champion, Hyunmi Choi, is the WBO, WBA belt holder. She's a lot younger. The European champions are in their 30s. Um, Choi is 29. She's also undefeated, 17 and 0. Well, Harper, well, Harper is yeah. Harper's younger. Harper is young as well. She's she's younger. She's yeah. only like 22, 23 years old. So Harper is the dominant um belt holder at super featherweight. She is. Um she's got two of the belts. Um although she she in theory co-holds with Brodnicka. Um you know, one of those deals. So Harper's the fight to make. Harper does need to get through her next fight, though. That's not a hundred percent a given uh, over Jonas. So we'll we'll see. But that's that's the way to go if they're ambitious. But there's some options if the Harper fight can't be made. And then you know, you do if you if you're looking upward at lightweight, 
You have Katie Taylor dominating lightweight, of course. She's the unified champion. Well, she's also in our news segment, so we'll get to it then. Indeed, indeed. And 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 um, let's move right on right. to the news segment. Let's move right on to the news set and mention uh, the aforementioned Katie Taylor. Um, after uh, after her uh, 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 bout with Amanda Serrano fell through because of financial uh, financial beef between Serrano and 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 um, Hearn, heck of a substitute here. And I go back to you, Gail, as Katie Taylor. Um, I wrote about this for Three Kings, Eddie Hearn. He quickly reached out to uh, uh, Delphine Pearson, former champion at 130 pounds, gave uh, uh, Taylor all kinds of hell uh, in 2019 on the Joshua Ruiz one undercard. Uh, a whole lot of folks believe that Pearson defeated Taylor that night, myself included. Um, even though Pearson lost I think it was earlier this year, kind of funky little bout where she was trying to compete for the Olympics or something like that. Um, she's still a viable name and a deal was struck quickly. And we're going to see uh, uh, Taylor Pearson, I believe in August, uh, a rematch in England. Um, so talk about it, Gail. Uh, a lot of people was wanting a Taylor Pearson, Pearson rematch ASAP after they fought in June of 2019. Um, circumstances beset. We're going to see it now. Your reaction? I love it. I'm not thrilled about how it came together, but I'm very glad it did. I'm with you, Michael. I'm one of the many people who thought Pursoon won and that Taylor got a gift on the cards. So if she wants to write that, she needs to go in and have a rematch and put her stamp on it. And she knew that we didn't think it happened so quickly. So when the Serrano fight fell apart, Eddie Hearn apparently picked up the phone and said, what do you think? And they said, we're up for it. And boom, they did the deal. And I do like it when it comes together that cleanly and that quickly. I think he was even a little bit surprised. So it's going to appear on the undercard of the white Povetkin card. Um, August 22nd being done at, uh, you know, Matchroom Square Garden out at uh, Matchroom headquarters in Essex, England. It's an outdoor venue. We're going to start seeing here uh, rolling uh, up cards as Matchroom gets going this summer. And I absolutely love it. Now, Pursoon did lose a fight in her nation's Olympic trials. Doesn't isn't going to hurt her professional record. She just didn't make the team and turned out it didn't really matter because there is no Olympic team right now for anybody. So she was ready. She's fresh from that experience. Um, you know, the, the two can get it on again. And that absolutely was a fight of the year candidate, you know, regardless of gender, it was a brawl. And funny enough, Pursoon bounced back from that decision loss with a win over Helen Joseph. <laughs> so she's loving the opportunity to get what she thinks she richly deserves. Taylor's saying she's going to prove the doubters wrong, all the makings of another great fight. And, you know, we bitch a lot about matchmaking and marinating and people getting hissy fits about you know fights coming together and what they want and what they don't want and we're going to talk about one of those coming up next or soon this one is right it turned out to be the right time it's a great fight nobody squabbled they're just going to get it done and get it on um, um see after a long bit of a hiatus uh gus from corruption and boxing has decided to join us um, I don't know how much you cover women's boxing, um, um, Gus, um, but I'm going to you. Uh, Katie Taylor, Delphine Pursoon, after the Serrano fight uh, fell through, uh, Pearson, uh Taylor rematch is going to happen in August, I believe. Your thoughts on that? 
You got some you got some background. Someone got some background yeah. noise. All right, we're getting some applause welcoming Gus back. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gus, if you can hear me, the, your thoughts on a Del, uh, on a Pearson um Katie Taylor rematch. Yeah, let's just get the uh, pleasantries out of the way. How are you guys all doing, Mike? What's going on? What's going on? We're doing great. Yeah. Better now that you're here. Yeah, thank you, Gail. It's always a pleasure. Um, mm -hmm. Don't know where Jacob is, but uh, congratulations on his new position. I know it was in a difficult time, but I'll, I'll catch up with him separately. Um, regarding the fight, Mike, it, it's a rematch. I think all of us here, pretty much the entire world, certainly in terms of women's boxing, uh, was was definitely looking. You know, for an immediate rematch, it would have been better because it it was a very very good first fight and uh katie taylor may have been i think it's you can make a very strong argument you know a recipient of a you know of an a-side decision you know the matchroom fighter to become undisputed um i think deep down she probably realized that you know delphine was very underestimated posed a significant problem everybody was telling her beforehand and uh, used her size and used her aggressive nature against, you know, a counter puncher in Katie Taylor, who had great deals of difficulty in engaging directly. Person was able to land, was was able to land straight right hands over her lead and sometimes lax jab and and, you know, she shortens her hook so Delphine was able to come round it and and land very good combinations and then come underneath her lead the hand. So there was several deficiencies in Katie's game plan that, that Delphine was able to exploit, you know, a little bit crude cumbersome at times, but a, a combination of, you know, you, you've got to even look at the economic situations. You know, this is a girl who, who still operates as a police officer in Belgium, Mike. So w when you, when you have, you know, the hunger and desire to really change your lifestyle and you know that 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 translates sometimes into performances that can just transform your entire career so and we saw that and she wasn't rewarded uh she was absolutely pissed off left the arena you know disillusioned um so we're glad that it's happening and 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 it, and, it, and it, and Katie had to take the rematch, Mike, because it, it it definitely is a dent on her legacy because it was a highly controversial decision. And to credit to Katie that she did say that yeah, a rematch is, is warranted. So, uh, you know, you guys will have to tell me about, you know, what Delphine's condition is like. I'm hearing it. She's been very ill herself. Or, I, I don't know how true the anecdotes and the rumors are, but... Um, I, I think it, it's 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 a fifty fifty fight, Mike. Absolutely, you know. I mean, if anything, if if there is an unbiased, if there's fair decision making apparatus surrounding the fight, then you know, I, I would I would lean towards Delphine pursue Mike. But uh, any any anything can happen. We don't know. We don't know whether politics is going to come into the equation again. But it's it's a fight. Personally, I'm I'm very much looking forward to, and and I hope Delphine pursue beats the shit out of her personally. Do you think there's there's any concern uh uh about Pursun losing that 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 amateur bout uh, uh earlier this year? Um you, yeah I, I think I think you know coming into any fight Mike you know momentum is 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 definitely important, but I don't know the circumstances. I didn't even see that bout. Uh, I don't know what shape she was in, whether she was just looking uh, for a little bit of activity, given the you know the current sort of tumultuous period. You know, uh, what 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 sort of level she performed at? Was she just looking for ring rust, or whether it, you know there was intensity? You guys will have to. You know, inform me all about that. I mean, how did she? What? How did she look? Was she going at fifty percent, sixty percent? The you problem is, is that the problem is we've only read about it. Um, okay. I've had difficulty uh, finding footage of it. 
Okay. So um, I've only read re reports about it, how basically Pure Soon uh, got off to a slow start and okay. she just couldn't do enough in the end. It was too much of a points lead uh, for Pure Soon to catch up. Um, I have been un unable to find uh, footage on it, be it YouTube or even Daily Motion. Uh, which always finds low key stuff. So, you know that makes sense. If you, if you look at her career and from from my understanding, she's definitely very much a front runner. If she she sets fights at a very high pace and she almost like a Tiger Woods in golf, that sort of side. You know, she can if she leads from the front, then she would definitely see out the fight. So if she started slowly in that fight and lost. Then that that goes into the logic of of her of the way she fights. So that, so I can only imagine there must have been a problem if she started like that, Mike, because it's very uncanny, very unca uncharacteristic for her. Um, I'll go to you, Daniel. Uh, uh, your thoughts on the uh, on the rematch that uh, we're going to see in August? I know a lot of people who observe women's boxing, um, they want to see it immediately, but uh, we finally get to see it now. And it's probably the only logical fight you could Serrano fall out. What other fight a contender man can make that's going to make a decent splash other than the fight that, in my opinion, against Pursuit. It's the only thing that can actually happen is just that you come out of this Avenger, your Avenger fight where you lost and you come out better for it in pro Probably a little bit more better bargaining position, at least in your eyes, when it comes to making that fight for, Ser for Serrano. Because that is obviously the end goal when it comes to Katie Taylor. Right? What's going to probably end up happening, though, is we're probably going to see a repeat of the first fight. Because since that amateur loss, Pursuit is going to try to come in probably with a more chip on her shoulder. Because people are going to dishonor her again. Hey, Taylor fans were already looking past her again. And this wasn't in Matchroom's original plan. They had to throw this on it again. So they threw this more as an afterthought, even though it's a logical fight to make after the Serrano fallout came in. It would be a real good fight. It's something that they should have, I agree with us, this should have been happening immediately afterwards. They should have just announced a real Rematch right after the first fight. Yeah, it was only one at that point, rather than to kind of sweep it under the rug and try to get the super fight going. But we're getting it now. We're gonna get it. You didn't think you could get it before. And like when we mentioned the talk of the Taylor Swan fight going into it, but it actually benefits it because that's a fight. Should Taylor win, that's a fight that needs a crowd. Whether it's in the UK or whether it's in the US, it needs a crowd. It's a fight that's big enough where it would, could gather a big enough crowd in its own merit. Absolutely right. Yeah. So it keeps Kaylee Taylor. We don't know what Manor Serrano is going to do, but this is a good thing to have. In the air, again, if you're an observer of women's boxing, just a world of observer of boxing in general, uh, you can't help but be happy about this fight. Let's move on to some other news. Um, I'm going to you, Gail, on this one, and then you can follow up Gus and Daniel. Um, got a case of a couple of fighters moving up. Um, Shakur Stevenson moving up from who held the WBO title at 126 pounds. He's moving, he announced he's moving up to 130. Um, Emmanuel Navarrete who held the WBO title at 122 pounds. He's moved, he announced he's moving up to 126. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Navarrete, I think in the new WBO rankings, I think he's ranked up there. Um, look for him to fight for that vacant title at 126 pounds. And Michael Conlon, who's, moved, who's been campaigning at 126 pounds his entire career, or throughout his entire early career is now ranked number three at 122 pounds by the WBO. So it looks like they're setting him up to fight for that vacant WBO uh, junior featherweight strap. But let's focus on Stevenson and Navarrete, Gail. 
Uh, your thoughts on both of them moving up? For me, I think it's pretty good timing. Uh, you saw Stevenson in his last bout. He weighed 131, but he looked filled out at the weight and looked strong. Uh, while Navarrete, I think Gus and I alluded to it, his last title defense. We didn't like how he looked. Uh, he looked sporadic. Uh, the energy was lacking in our in our opinion in assessing his last title defense. Uh, he just looked, he fought in spurts, but so I think his body is calling for him to move up to 126 pounds. So in terms of both Stevenson and Navarrete Gale, I think the timing is very apt that they decided to move up in weight. It's perfect timing. They are two of the few fighters for whom the pandemic has not really hurt them. They've seized the opportunity. They've been aided by the fact that top rank it was the only game in town. And let's face it, the WBO has always been very good to Grandpa Bob. You know, it's uh, what Bob orders, right? So it, it almost feels like a family of brothers where they're all out growing their clothes and they're, and they're handing them down. They're just handing them down the line. They're going to just hand these belts down the line. It, it's all very convenient. But nobody's doing something they shouldn't have done. Stevenson made it very clear even before his last fight, listen, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm going back down to 126 unless it's a massive fight. Um, he was having trouble making it. He wanted to see how he felt at 130. He felt great at 130. He looked great at 130. It's no reason for him to move down. So it's, it's good timing. How never ready was making 122 as tall as he is and still have that much power. Who the hell knows? Youth was on his side, apparently. So it's a good move for him to go up. I'd like to see him carry the power up. I hope he can carry the speed up with him. You know, we'll we'll see. He's so darn talented that, you know, even the tiniest loss um, either direction is not going to hurt him very much. Um, you know, Conlon's an interesting story. Bob loves him. He draws a great audience. He's very charismatic. He's not in the skill league of the other two. He's just not. He's, he's a fine fighter. I like the effort he puts in. I'm not sure the natural skills or the skill development potential is there. Having said that, I, I applaud him for maximizing what he's got. This would be the right opportunity for him to go for that vacant title and then we see what happens from there. But I, I think all will be pleased with the outcome. And once again, these are things top right can control within their universe of operations, which is admittedly limited during the pandemic. Not every promoter can play. They can't bring in a lot of fighters from outside the United States um, quickly. You know, it takes a lot of thought, a lot of planning. And you know, we've seen how fights in the bubble um, you know, they hope for six fight or eight fight cards and they've rarely, rarely gotten them because guys test positive teams test positive and you know, there we are, but I like the plan. It makes sense for every one of these guys. It gives them a platform right now with very little other competition from the big names. You know, we wouldn't really be thinking and focusing a lot on guys like Stevenson or Navarrete in particular, um, you know, if Wilder Fury was afoot, right? So this is their time. They're smart to seize it right now. Um, guys, we had talked about how sluggish uh, Navarrete looked in his last uh, uh, title defense. Um, so I think I think you agree with me that um, the time is right for him to move up now. Uh, your thoughts on on Shakur Stevenson? Um, your views of him as a fighter? Do you think that um, he's ready? Uh, 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 to move up and, and face the likes of a herring, face the likes of, of, of Burchelt, fix the likes of uh, Jojo Diaz. When a, when a precocious young fighter uh, medals at a, at a major amateur tournament, whether it's the World Championship or even more significantly the Olympic Games, we see the, uh, the vultures of promoters, you know, circling him uh, ready to sort of entice him and offer him whatever you know, deals and 
And and this is why Shakur Stevenson signed with top rank and, and Bob Arum. Because when you're gifted a world championship against your girlfriend's brother, who was a hundred to one underdog, now you realize why, you know, Shakur signed for, you know, for, for top rank. And then after that, he went on from a hundred to one, he went on to fight a 250 to one guy very recently in the lockdown. So Mike, it's, it's only age and youth. They're the only two sort of mitigating factors against the barrage of criticism that I can level upon him. But, from the time in which, you know, Larry has a junior, the uh, New Jersey commissioner, when I sort of interacted with him a number of years ago, he was the one who mentioned, you know, Shakur Stevenson to me when he was 16 years old at the time. He said, keep an eye on him. I think he's going to win the Olympics. Um, so from from the time I saw him uh, in in uh, in Brazil, um, you know, up against uh, Rabicia Ramirez in the final, where he did reasonably well, but there was a few buys. But he was very lean, green, one-handed fighter um, to what he is now, Mike. You know, there is significant development there. He's, he's, he's developed his right hand. And if you remember, Mike, when he turned professional, I said to you, I don't want to hear Shakur Stevenson I'm, until he's in his 10th or 11th or 13th fight. Just let him develop. I don't want to hear. I don't even really want to see him until I see, you know, some level of development and ability. And, and for, for, excuse me, me, excuse me for interrupting, but for me, Gus, it wasn't yeah. just that. For me, it was the gym stories because the gym stories tell it all. And when you hear how he had his way with Devin Haney, when you hear how he had his way with uh, 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 Lopez. When you hear how he had the event, had the better of it with his contemporaries in the gym, that for me, that's where you know that where you know that is the telltale sign that he he is something. Um, just like in my interview uh, when I did with uh, Kathy Duva a while back, I tried to pull it out of her, but she wasn't she wasn't biting. Um, the stories of Sweet P when he was an amateur. And what he did to a Hector, world, Hector Camacho, who was a world yeah. champion, that tells me right there, that will tell you right there that Sweet Pea was going to be something. Um, Shane Mosley, 16, 17 years old, sparring with uh, an Azuma Nelson and holding his own, that tells me right there that he's going to be the signs that he was going to be a pretty good pro. And so when I start hearing the stories of what he was doing with to his contemporaries, uh, uh, Stevenson, that lets me know that there's something there. Uh, proceed. Yeah but, Mike, yeah, but Mike, conversely, there's there's a lot of fighters who showed prodigious talent as as sparring partners in the gym, etc. But it never translated in the professional rank. So it's 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 difficult just in isolation, you know, ju looking at you know the potential barometer of just gym stories, how a career is going to. There's so many variable factors, but I, I hear the argument that you're, and and certainly with a fighter like that as well. But he's he might he's not really had any any sort of level live bodies in his professional ranks thus far. Um, so he's 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 captured one world championship belt, and, it, and it's a bit of an indictment on boxing in the manner in which he's done it. Uh, you know, fostered by you know the power and the magnitude of the promotional company that's delivered it for him. But, you know, those are the benefits in boxing. It happens and it's happened for a very long time. So I'm not, I'm not going to be too critical by that. It's, it's happened. It goes back to even the 1900s as well. And even when mafioso and the Costa Nasta come in, you know, their fighters always gained superiority over other fighters. So it, it's it, boxing has never been a level playing field, nor has the world. So that, that, that's that's fine, but now yeah, he's 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 moving up and his bodies. You, you can see when he's rehydrating, Mike. He's rehydrating massively. So he didn't want another situation like a Daigo Higa or a Lee Selby staying too too late at a specific weight division and then losing the fight because and even a Jared Hurd against you know J Julian Williams. You know if if Julian Williams and Jared Hurd happens at one sixty. Does Julian Williams really win that fight? I, I don't know, Mike. I don't think so. But that's a different argument. So 
a wise decision moving up. It's a pity him and Josh Warrington didn't happen. You know, Josh Warrington was desperate for that fight and he wanted to make his uh, his debut in the United States. I think it would have been an absolutely tremendous fight. You know, there's Kanzu. There were so many great fights that could have been made that that didn't happen. I, I, I don't know why. Um, whether Sh Shakur had indicated to, you know, or Andre Ward on his behalf that, that you know, don't go into those fights. They're too dangerous if you're struggling at the weight. You know, don't take the risk. You know, you know we can we can market you a lot better as an undefeated one weight world champion moving up. So maybe it, 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 it's a conscious decision in the long term of his career as he's still very very young. So, um, so wise decision, Mike. But you know. Maybe now you know we'll get some you know better level of fighters at a, you know at 130 pounds. I'm not even sure how long he can even remain at 130, Mike. Look at nah, he's moving up to 135 soon, no doubt about yeah. it. Your your thoughts yeah. on your thoughts on Navarrete um at 126? Um, th there's there's so much talent and ability there, Mike, and he's he's kept himself very busy, but he's he's had no meaningful opponents. You know, caused the destruction on on the Ghanaian boy, and unfortunately, that may have you know destroyed his in Isaac Dogby's career. That might have that might have destroyed this guy's career. It certainly shortened Isaac Dogby's career. There's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, if Dogby has one more significant loss, that could be his retirement at such a young early stage. I, I sincerely hope not. But uh, he's got size, presence. Struggled a bit against the Filipino Michael. I thought at one stage. And that told me there and then that he didn't have the strength in his rehydration. He looked extremely weak in that fight. You know, he managed to pull it out later on, so I give him credit. He showed some resurgence. Um, so I, yeah, I think it's, I think it's. We we were calling for him to be moving up over a year ago, Mike. So it's, it's, it was a, it was a fundamental decision for him to do so. I think he's got the ability to go in the ring and fight against anyone, Mike. And I think um, I, I, I really hope that Zanfer and Top Rank actually do that because he's he's very keen on ha on having fights. And I've heard some interviews with him on Mexican TV as well, and he's talked about now that you know once he's able to acclimate himself to his he's you know a natural weight, then then he's he's looking to fight, you know. He said five, even six times a year, Mike, even up against top 10 level opponents in you know, a ring magazines rated top 10 fighters. So his desire is there. If it can be reciprocated by the promoters, then, you know, then then we've got a potential gem on our hands. So let's, you know, let, let, let's hope that they, you know, that they, they, they match him up against good fighters and he can fight for world championship fights. I wouldn't say immediately, Mike, but I'd say one fight. Let's see how he looks. And then, you know, if he's vacated the belt, then he's going to have, you know, he's, he's going to have good ranking points, you know, and be in prime position to fight for a title real soon. So, you know, look forward to it. Um, I'll pose the same question about Navarrete uh, that I asked Gus. I'll pose the same question to you, Daniel. <laughs> Um, how do you think he will fare at 126 pounds? Um, I'm guessing just right now that he'll probably fight Jesse Magdaleno for that vacant WBO belt. Uh, that's just my observation. Um, and in and, and terms of, of Stevenson at 130, what do you think? Uh, as far as not right there, at featherweight, it works. I Thought he was probably going to stay at 122 for the rest of the year because of the circumstances. But moving up now, testing the waters now, it's a smart move in the long run. And setting up a fight with Magdaleno. Okay, keeps everything within the top right house. All these moves, if you noticed, have been to keep everything. House. There's a reason the WBO is called where Bob's organization is side of the Atlantic. Including the um, um, not so subtle move to as move, far as the uh, of course, put, uh, already, that one to is going to put Conlon be... down at 122 to rank him at 122. 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They, they always said exactly. Up like so that's that was a really shy move because that. Yeah, because remember, we were talking for a bit about Shakur and Conlon down the, the line. And now you're separating them by two divisions. So you're giving that fight a, a lot more time to marinate now, especially in the future. Now, when it comes to war and 130, that is going to be interesting to me. Depending on which opponent they pick. Because I know... He has good skills, so he's smart, but I don't think he's faced somebody with the punching power of Herbert Chell. So I'm not so quick as of a lot of people to say that Stevenson would just outclass Burchell. What it, there's a much likelier chance that Burchell could outpunch Stevenson. And we have to remember power in both hands. So that to me is going to be very interesting. And I, like I said, I've been, I've been a pretty good advocate of him 30 years, but I would, I would love to see right, right now, if you're giving me that part, do you, I want to see Shakur versus, <clears throat> sorry, against Jojo Diaz. Very decent fighters. Two really, really good amateur pedigrees. And you have something that you can definitely sell either both on ESPN or DAZN. So that to be the very fights in the future. And I would probably, if it was between those two, I would definitely. I'll lean more times, like in my own honest opinion, I would not. I would not put him anywhere near Burchell. No, no, not now. Um, I don't. Burchell has to kind of revert back to form. I would like this kind of boxing thing of Burchell we're seeing against uh, um, against uh, 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 Stevenson. Um, I would like to see Burchell get more physical. In a fight against Stevenson, if he does, uh, uh, Stevenson's a heck of a boxer, in my opinion. But it would be like it would be nice to see how a physical Burchelt, as big and strong as he is, and he can punch too. Um, that would be a, a, a proper. That would be uh, something that that Stevenson has not dealt with uh, at this point of his career, and how he will react to that. Uh, that that would be the question. But anybody else at 130 pounds? I think Stevenson will stand a good chance of beating in, in terms of Navarrete. Um, I think he has a much, a little bit tougher proposition at 126 pounds. Um, like I said, I think he's going to fight Magdaleno for that 126 pound belt. Um, Magdaleno, me, maybe it's my, I think Magdaleno will give him a tougher fight, but in comparison to the other champions, um, I would, I would keep, I would keep Navarrete away from Gary Russell. I think he's the best in the division. Him, uh, Navarrete and Warrington uh, or um, Kanzu, um, that would be a heck of a fight. I would love I would love Navarrete to fight either of those guys eventually, uh, particularly Warrington. But um, it's a wait and see. It's a wait and see on in terms of, of, of where uh, where he goes. Um, what about um, what about Michael Conley? You were mentioning before they're lining him up. Who against potentially? Um, he's ranked number three. Uh, let okay. me. He's ranked number three today. Uh, give me a quick second. Let me look at the ranking systems. Give me a quick second. Um, <laughs> I would guess. I was hearing that it could be this guy. Is it Stephen Fulton? Some. And this Stephen Fulton. See. Stephen Fulton is actually his next fight is going to be for the vacant title uh, coming up. It's going to be for that vacant belt. It's my understanding. So I he's could see. Boxer, Mike. Yeah, he's a, um, he's um, um, uh, my comrades over at Three Kings think very highly yeah. of Fulton. Yeah, um, I suppose, they think yeah. he. They think he's uh, world championship pedigree. Oh, and I mean, yeah. And 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 I would guess 
uh, uh, that they're positioning um, Conlon to fight a folk fight, but certainly a Fulton if he was to win his upcoming battle. He's fighting an undefeated guy. His name okay. escapes me right now, but I, I could see a Conlon uh, Fulton fight sometime in 2021, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't see a very high ceiling for Michael Conlon, like, not from what you I've don't? seen. No, I don't know. Um, no. Explain why quickly. Um, he's he's a very one-dimensional boxer, Mike. Um, he's very very easy to predict. I I I, I sat down and look at the patterns of of the way he throws his punches. Um, whether he does certain combinations. Uh, at, at certain times, whether he tends to vary, and there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of variation. There's there's not a lot of what fighters call like a, you know the proactive, proactive move off when if he's coming in and he's landing like you know body shots or whatever else, he tends to move out in the same direction as well. Even when counter punches are landing, so. There's just certain certain nuances if you if you just really critically analyze the way he fights. I I don't see, I don't see a lot of development w with him and Adam Booth. Um, Adam Adam Booth has always worked with those those kind of ambush type fighters who, who 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 lean back and have that quick snap punches like the way George Groves and and sort of David Hay and the way. He's working with this fighter from um, from the north of England at the moment. Uh, his name escapes me at 154 uh, from Sunderland, uh, who's who looks terrible to me as well. Very quick twitch fighter. Um, oh shit, I can't remember. Kelly. His name. Yeah, yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. This guy is very, very vastly overrated, uh, if not terrible in my opinion. But that that's another. Yeah, so th those are the, ten the, the fighters who do who don't have like fundamental defensive skills, but they rely on their athletic and their reflex to sort of move out of the way, and that 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 can only survive for a certain thing. Once you start getting injuries in your bodies, and, and you lose that elasticity and flexibility, you've got to transition onto something else. But with 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 Conlin, Mike, I, I don't see any of that at all. I just see. I just see a one-dimensional sort of linear, linear puncher. Has a bit of combination punching at times. Has a bit of body punching, but is very easily hit. And when he fought against that Igus Klimas fight, uh, one of his fighters, uh, you know, the, the young, I don't know whether he was Russian or Ukrainian, a Southpaw fighter. The Southpaw fighter was able to attack Conlin very easily at times as well. Right? But he never got he could, he never got the the benefit on the cards from hardly any of the judges. I don't think they they scored that fight properly, in my opinion, Mike. I thought Conlin probably did enough to win the fight, but you know they they were just dismissing the amount of times that he was getting hit, uh, and his face was getting busted up as well. So I think he's very easily hit, Mike. And if if Fulton goes in the ring with with, with Conlin, Mike. And I wouldn't even say 2021. I think he can go in the ring with him in six months' time and beat him. No problem. Mm, mm, interesting, interesting. Let's move on to uh, another topic here. It's been a long time since we heard from Gail. I'm going to get her back into the discussion. I know she has to leave uh, 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 in a bit. Um, Gilberto Ramirez, former champion at 168 pounds, um, long battle behind the scenes with top rank. Uh, it was recently uh, announced, and I wrote about this for Three Kings Boxing. You can check it out on threekingsboxing.com. Uh, his team and top rank have agreed behind the scenes to part ways. The question that I have for you, Gail, uh, is this a smart move on the part of Zerto? Zerto was not necessarily a cash cow, was not necessarily a, a, a marketable fighter, uh, but he had the backing of a powerful uh, uh, outlet in top rank. Uh, where does he go from here? And now that he's leaving top rank, 
do you think that he could get the big fight, that he can get the big money, that he can get the big opportunity um, elsewhere? Zerto's timing sucks. <laughs> I mean, plain and simple. He's leaving the one promoter in the United States that can get him fights. Not big money fights, admittedly, but at least is out there in the action. And no matter where he goes, all of the promoters are handicapped by the same problems of lack of a gate, they'll, the problems of the pandemic, travel issues. You know, a lot of the best guys like heavyweight are not Americans. That's a problem. <sighs> but having said all that, having just pointed out all the reasons, it might not have been the smartest thing for him to do. If you've lost faith, if you've lost faith in your promoter, if there's that mental block, if you're just not getting along, it really is better to leave. Now, it is a really interesting question. Where is he going to go? I mean, is he going to go to PBC? I don't think, I really don't think so. I just, maybe he thinks that's a good fit for him. I'm not like I say the zone. I'm thinking the zone. I'm thinking Matchroom USA is probably the best choice for him. But you know, you should have a chat with Zanfer. Honest to God, it's certainly a possibility. And here's the irony Zanfer and Top Rank do a lot of work together, but he could be represented by Zanfer and still get the benefit. Potentially, I mean, he's a Mexican star. He could go home, so to speak. You know, it's possible to be worth a try. He'd be a bigger fish in their pond as well. So those are definitely the two choices. PBC should be avoided at all costs. It's just not the right fit in his division. I'll pose the same question to you, uh, Daniel. You can follow up, Gus, in terms of Zerto Ramirez. Yeah, okay, he got what he wanted in terms of separating from top rank, but where exactly does he go? Where is the best fit for him? I, I made my opinion a little bit well known on Twitter. Uh, I believe that's humanized. I have a feeling that he's probably not going to go to Zampa. I have a feeling he's going to go to PBC. Because amazing enough, PBC is going to start putting on some fights pretty soon, I think. So it's probably a good way for me got convinced otherwise because the only other option is the zone. That's the only option. And if you're, if you're a Zerto, if the way you've been marketed, the way you have wanted to be yourself against. There's only one fight in the zone that you want, and that's Canelo. I right now, like I said, we'll, we'll probably talk about it soon, but Canelo right now is doing his own <laughs> little game of musical chairs for opponents in September. So that's the only way to view. The only option is probably going to be Heyman. He'll probably give him some easy fights to build up and then maybe try to wedge his way into the light heavyweight picture just to claim one of the belts, just like how he had it for a long time. He had a Donna Stevenson right there. So there's always a way for to go in there, but the timing, I agree with Gail, the timing is just terrible. Right now it's just terrible, particularly in the light heavyweight division. There's really not a lot happening, but we kind of knew this has been happening for a while now because, like I said, Azurdo has wanted to become the next Canelo. He's hoping to market against Canelo. And most of it is his own body of work. He hasn't been able to grab that attention of a Canelo. And he feels that it, it's Bob's fault. What say you, Gus? Zerto uh, uh, leaving top rank. I think it's a. I, I think it's a little bit disappointing, Mike. Um, but it's it, 
his his next decision is obviously dependent on on on, on his proclivity as a fighter. Like, what does he want to do? Um, has a great deal of ability. I was high on him from the very start. Um, can punch. He can box. Tremendous body punch as well. Um, does have that ability where he's always leaning over his lead foot and he's getting caught, so he's never really corrected that deficiency. But, you know, exciting fighter. Um, but the career has, has um, after capturing the world championship from from Arthur Abrahams, um, you know, he had a couple of exciting fights with the, um, with the top-ranked fighter. Two, I'm not sure... Um, what what his name was a uh, uh, name just escapes me, but you know had some good fights, but it it, it depends, Mike. You know, is he laser focused on Artur Baterbiev if he's campaigning at 175 pounds? So, you know, if he is, then then what what promotional company simplifies that route to get to a unified champion, which he should be aiming at if he has any aspirations of of being the next Canelo, etc. Then. Because the problem, obviously the problem, problem is coming. the way Bertha Biel has been fighting lately. I don't want that if I'm his handlers. I think that's, that's a tremendous. I think Mike. I think that that stylistically is a brilliant fight. People can say what the hell are you talking about corruption, but I think that I, I've looked at that fight and I think it's a brilliant fight, Mike. I think with the, with the volume and the boxing ability and the southpaw of, of Ramirez and his body and his ability to move laterally because Baterbiev does not have good feet, Mike. He never did have as an amateur. He can be a little bit deceptive and crude, but so, so Ramirez stylistically does have the ability and he has the volume as well. I don't know whether he's got the power, but Baterbiev, uh, we've seen, is not infallible, Mike. You know, punches have, have dropped him. You know, the British Commonwealth champion, you know, gave him a bit of trouble with that left hook as well. So, are you talking about um, Johnson? Yeah, Callum Johnson. Yeah, yeah. He, he definitely had a bit of snap. And, and Callum Johnson made the mistake after knocking him down. He wasted, what was it, 14 or 16 seconds without even throwing a punch. Otherwise, Baterbiev could have been knocked out. So, I don't know what happened in that moment for him, but that's another. So, you know what? What is what is, what is Baterbiev's situation promotionally? I know he had a lot of problems with Yvonne Michel over in, in in Canada. I don't know whether he's able to, whether he sorted out that that that. Correct. Legal um, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Gail. But is he's with top rank right now? Uh, uh, he has a fight coming up against uh, uh, the, the Chinese guy, uh, Fan Long. Um, I'm hearing it's in um, going to happen in Russia. Correct me if I'm wrong, Gail. I know you're absolutely correct on his representation now with top rank. Um, and let me see what the status is quickly on his, whether they've set a date. But yeah, that's his target opponent at this point. Um, yeah, no official date set it looks like. But uh, again, a lot of what's going to be the problem here is, you know, pandemic travel restrictions and any you know any other problems that come along so but that's the one in the works um you know in the fight that everybody's yapping about down the road somewhere crazy as it sounds is better be even canelo and i think better be even ramirez would be canelo light warm-up for better be of i you know i agree with you gus he's not the most mobile fighter um but he only has to really get close to you once to do some serious damage. You know, and my problem with Zerto is Gus, he always in fights just fights lazy. Just <laughs> lackadaisical. I don't get yeah. it. It's the level of competition there, Mike. Trust me. I I, I think he's 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 that sort of lackadaisical character. He's been like he's his coaches were talking about that like three, four years ago as well. In the in the gym, he'll sit down. He'll, he'll start re relaxing with his friends, listening to music. He's that's it. That's in inherent in his nature, Mike. So much natural ability, but but you're right with that lackadaisical attitude, and and it's gonna. It, it may just take a ferocious punch of somebody like that to put the fright of life in him. That would just get him to you know 
shift him up a gear. So why not, mate? My, my, he's just fucking around and doing absolutely nothing, Mike. So, you know, either he goes to the grave or he rises above the challenge, mate. Boy, I'll tell you, though, <laughs> you're right, Gus and, and Michael. It's frequently for a fighter with talent, it takes being clocked and, you know, having a little sense knocked into you very literally to put your careers to rights. But damn, does it have to be this guy? <laughs> I mean, he pretty much sent Alexander Vosdick into retirement. Jeez, that's yeah. just insane. Um, I, I'm not sure I would wish that on Zordo. If you mean if he wants to take it, fine. But I think that would be a big mistake. I really do. I, I agree with you guys. He's very better be of is not very mobile. So for a fighter really light on their feet, that's an advantage. But Bostek moves very well, and look what happened to him. Indeed, indeed. Let's move on to uh, a final story here. And I'll just, this will be a free for all for anybody who wants to talk about it. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised that this fight is going to happen. Um, there's been a proposed WBC lightweight kind of tournament that's going down uh, 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 um, between Haney um, and others. But the fight I'm interested in is that Ryan Garcia, who gets a lot of attention, a lot of buzz, a lot of talk, uh, as much as for his popularity outside the ring and on social media as what he does in the ring, he has agreed to fight uh, former um, world title challenger uh, uh, Luke Campbell. Campbell uh, uh, gave uh, Jorge Linares a good scrap a couple of years ago. I know some folks uh, have argued that he beat Linares on the night and he gave Lomachenko a, a tough go a tough go before uh, succumbing uh, uh, to the to uh, Loma, um, even hurt Loma uh, um, in that bout uh, in the middle rounds. Um, for anybody who wants to talk about it, uh, thought you, s smart move on the part of Garcia agreeing uh, to fight Campbell. Um, is Campbell too good, too seasoned for him, or are they looking at Campbell saying at age? I think he's 32 now um it's the right chance it's the right chance to make it this time of his career and this is for anybody uh, go ahead. okay uh I'll start. oh no good go ahead Gail. I'm sorry. I'll jump right in you know i think ryan finally realized he was painting himself into a corner a very difficult corner where you know a lot of shade was going to come down on him yeah, I get it. He feels he's worth more money. Um, and he knows he's got Oscar De La Hoya, you know, somewhat of a difficult position. They need him. But, you know, for once, I think Oscar did the right thing when Garcia balked about coming back for less money. And he said, fine, Virgil Ortiz, come on down. And Virgil said, yes, sir. When, sir? How high, sir? <laughs> That's Ortiz Jr.'s, you know, attitude is, you know, uh, yeah, I just need to know how high to jump and I'm there. And I don't think Garcia liked that too much. And so he sounded off, you know, he's prone to wearing his heart on his sleeve and fighting his battles in public, you know, on social media, like a lot of people of his generation. I also think, however, he has the right advisors and is smart enough. Once his outburst is over, he realizes, you know, the better of it. I think he really does. Then you've got to find a way to walk it back with dignity. Um, and that's the harder part. Being offered the Campbell fight, there's your walk back with dignity. And as late as last Friday, I was hearing Oscar De La Hoya say, you know, Yes. Yeah. This has been a rough relationship. Hey, I get it. It's repairable. I, but he's a star. We can make him a star. We know what to do. I've been down that road. Those were all the right things to say. So once again, we're going to see Ryan and Oscar kiss and make up, put together a great fight, you know, and this is one 
this is one promotional pairing where the pandemic has not been kind. It's it's made things rougher than they needed to be versus some of these other guys we just talked about under the top rank banner who have benefited. So let's hope that the zone's first fights here this weekend, which we're going to preview with said Virgil Ortiz is a success. They follow up quickly with Ryan. Love the idea of this tournament. And I'm sure he was said, he was also told, listen, you want that title, you want that belt, you need to participate. We're going to have this de facto tournament. You in? Yeah. Let us know now. And I think he decided to do the right thing. But darn, it was rough getting there. Um, you was wanting to chime in, Daniel? <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, when it comes into this entire mess, you knew that one way or another, Ryan was going to get his way, at least halfway, just because of the fact that, like I mentioned, he, via his his affiliation with Canelo in his camp is put Oscar in a pretty weird corner. Now, I, he did call the bluff. Stepped up and ready to go. And he's already said that I think later on that if he does good in that fight, if it was quick, if the Canelo card of September comes through, he'll be ready. When you have that going along, you're going to have a very, very good chance to win. Now, as far as this fight, say what people want about Ryan Garcia when it comes to what he does on Instagram, to like being social, uh, a little bit of late ego. It has led him some track way because look what the WBO did when he took this fight. They were going to put, he's ranked number one, I think, by the WBO for lightweight. He could have easily won and then challenged Lomachenko. He could have done that. When he, he chose Luke Campbell, the devil today just pretty much said, uh, yeah, we're not going to have any tournament right now for a lightweight champion. So, he, so there's a little bit of weight behind Ryan Garcia's words. Now, as far as when they come, to him and Campbell. Campbell's very well tested, very skilled. We saw what he did with somebody like Jorge Linares. The thing is, though, is that Ryan is younger. Ryan does have a little bit faster hands, and he is growing into the power of a lightweight. This is going to be a very, very fun fight. And if you get it, that fight going, suddenly that potential matchup you could have had with Lomachenko if you chose that WBO route looks a lot more amazing now. You're also then carrying another belt. Um, I go to I go to you guys. Look, uh, the amigo says walk it like I talk, walk it like you talk it. Well, for uh, Garcia, he gets that opportunity to walk it like he talks it now. He talks a whole lot. Uh, he talks about how he's ready and, and whatnot. He talks about how he deserves to get paid and paid a lot, he paid his worth, as he likes to say. Well, he gets his opportunity to show and prove that what he's, a, what he's about. I give him credit for uh, stepping up to the plate and taking the chance to fight AAA Campbell. But, yeah. Luke Campbell, I know he lost twice in world title bids, but this guy is no joke and far from a guarantee that Ryan Garcia will pass this test. Your thoughts? You know, Mike, in, in a way, Mike, I, I was disappointed that um, the, the Ryan Garcia and uh, Jorge Linares fight uh, didn't happen because uh, that was shaping up to be a, a decent fight, certainly after... Jorge's uh, resurgence in his last fight in, in the manner in which he disposed of a previous Ryan Garcia victim who actually gave him a tremendously difficult fight. Um, so I, I thought Jorge Linares was, was going to, you know, execute him in the ring. But uh, for all of the, you know, the trials and tribulations that have, you know, ensued during the period, 
Uh, I'm just wondering what what was it that that instigated Ryan to maybe revise his expectations and 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 take this fight, uh, whether it was you know influence from the Canelo Alvarez camp or some sort of talk about that Canelo may that that his remuneration may also be impacted uh, at this time as well because uh, I'm. As you know, Mike, you know, I, I've analyzed DAZN and I, I made a video about DAZN and their financial status and the way their company is set up a number of years ago. And I, I spoke about all of the rights fees that they've got around the world and how badly they are leveraged. Um, and and this, this current business model is not sustainable, Mike. Even for Sir Leonard Blavotnik, with, whose company structure I understand very well because I've actually studied it for another project. Uh, so, you know, there's difficulties there. Uh, the revenue stream for DAZN is not there, Mike. They've got very long-term contracts and their revenue stream will only start to increase after a certain number of years, but it's dependent on an inc on a incremental increases in subscriptions progressively in at least, you know, six countries si simultaneously. So it's a very, it's a real tough business model, Mike, real hard for them to actually degenerate any sort of revenue after years. So um, I'm not sure what's gone on behind the scenes, but I, I'm sure all of their fighters, Mike, will be impacted. Um, I don't know how tight the agreements are that Canelo Alvarez has. If he's guaranteed that some, then they're obviously going to have to fulfill it. But for, for Ryan and other fighters to be demanding astronomical wages before they've even achieved anything, you know, thinking that, thinking that their social media presence can somehow translate into dollar signs in fights. Well, let's see. Let, let's see if all of these fans from social media will flock into the fights. You know, I, I, you know I'm sure Gail has better information on these, on how many tickets he sells or how many views he gets, whether, it, whether, whether he is one of those commodities that has that, that ability to reach out and, and become a bigger star like that. I'm sure it it, it would there will be some sort of financial benefit to Golden Boy in, in in that sort of sense. So they're looking at it, and and Oscar De La Hoya sees a lot of in him. Mike, you can see definitely power levels in him. You know, Oscar De La Hoya was my God, he was going off the deep end in these twenties as well at that time. You know, so I think it's I think it's somebody who can. Who, who Ryan Garcia can definitely look at and, and not try and replicate the same mistakes as well. But De La Hoya is a promoter, like is somebody I actually like, and I've spoken about it in the past. He'll put in his run, his young prospects tough, and he's done that over, over the last three, four years as well. So it's time for Ryan Garcia to sink or swim. And maybe it's a good time for him to fight Luke Campbell, Mike, who's unfortunately for Luke, um, he's never won his world title. That that his very decorated amateur career had had promised, but he's had some difficult fighters to contend with in the professional ranks. And you know he hasn't done himself a disservice. He's put in decent performances, but ultimately he's failed, Mike. And people can talk about the Vasily Lomachenko fight, Mike, but I felt Lomachenko handled him with with relative ease, Mike. You know, Luke had the had the numerical advantages all the, in, in in height and reach and everything like that, but Vasily, I felt won nine, ten rounds, Mike. Uh, although although it was competitive, but I felt you know Vasily was was dominant and and obviously dropped him late with a body shot as well, um, and he went down in his other world championship fight with with, with Jorge Linares, but he recovered actually very well, so. A, a very good textbooks boxer um, does have power for a southpaw as well. Um, you know, Ryan Garcia, us, you know, has a lot of that has a lot of technical deficiencies. Mike is he's, he's still too upright, even even with the even with the renaissance, but he's able to knock out his opponents very early. So we've not learned how we've not seen how. How well he's developed on the, you know, the, the Reynoso. So there's still, there's still a lot of unanswered questions as to his chin as well. Um, so 
that's that's a 50 50 fight Mike. you know i'm I, i'm sure the odds will be very heavily in favor for ryan garcia so there's this potential money to be made with a luke campbell who i think he i think luke can definitely outbox him mike and potentially even knock him out um so i i think i think that fight i think a very good hedge play on that fight is that you can pick for you can pick for the fight not to go the distance and you can hedge your play on any fighter mike i think both fighters are capable of knocking each other out in that fight so that's not a bad shot mike the fight not to go to the distance i think you can get good money on that indeed indeed uh uh, depends on where you on where you want to go because uh, I, I'm assuming a lot of people will put some money. A lot of people will put early money on, on Garcia, and I could see someone making a play late uh, uh, for Campbell to win by decision or uh, even win by late stoppage. So, uh, from a betting perspective, you're absolutely right on that one, Gus. Um, I want to say, Gail, she had Luke, Luke Campbell in in a lot of his he's i don't know how many times he's hit the canvas but he does have that propensity to go down quite a lot so yeah you can you can that that's not a bad shot mike over for ryan garcia to get a very quick knockout victory or for luke campbell to take it late and get that that knockout victory so th th that could be a very good that could be a very good over over and under for you know for a quick Ryan Garcia or Luke Campbell late. Right. Um, yeah. I want to thank Gail who had to uh, dip out early uh, on us. Uh, if you want to uh, talk boxing, want to talk uh, uh, media as well because she does teach media. Uh, you can check her out. You can check out her boxing stuff on our communities digital news as com c o m m d i g d i g i news dot com, um, or you can follow her on Twitter. Um, PR Pro uh, uh, San Diego. Again, you can check her out, her boxing stuff out on Communities Digital News, and you can check her out on Twitter at uh, PR Pro San Diego. Let's get into uh, some previews right quick before we decide to shut things down. Uh, uh, two main fights I want to focus on. I'm going to do two and one here because we're running short on time. Uh, fights that's happening uh, tomorrow, uh, which is the 21st. We're recording this live on July 20th, as well as later on in the week on the 23rd, I believe it is. Oh, no, down on the 23rd, the 24th, excuse me. Uh, tomorrow, you got Jason um, Oscar Valdez, former WBO champion at 126 pounds. He's moving up to 130. Um, fighting Jason, Jason uh, Velez, this is presumably his uh, step up fight. Um, if he wins, he's going to fight um, Burchelt uh, um, either later this year or early next year. And, us, and Virgil Ortiz Jr., um, I think the best prospect on the Golden Boy stand, on the Golden Boy stable by far. Um, he's fighting uh, uh, Samuel Vargas. So for you, Gus, and both Gus and Daniel, your thoughts on Valdez and Velez, as well as Virgil Ortiz Jr. fighting Samuel Vargas. I'll take the uh, the Jason Velez and Valdez. Is a, I think that's a very good fight, Mike. I've got tremendous, tremendous amount of respect for Jason Velez. He is a pro's pro. He shared the ring with Gany Granovich. You know, I think that was a split decision draw when he fought for the IBF belt. He's fought uh, Jojo Diaz, Rene Alvarado. Uh, he's even fought Ryan Garcia. So he, he, Machado as well. I think he, he went, he fought, I think he almost had a Juan Manuel Lopez as well. So he, he's been in the ring, Mike, with pretty much everyone. 21 knockouts in 26 fights. So he's got power. Uh, five or six defeats, one draw. I'm just I'm just going on top of my head, not on box, Rick. So good fighter, Mike. Very good fighter. Very underrated fighter. I think in his last fight against that Jaime Albalado, who was the the touted sort of prospect who was 12 and 0. That was a brilliant fight. And um, uh, I, I think it, whether it was a split decision loss or something or a majority loss, something like that. But uh, if I recall at the time, you know, we uh, a, a lot of the observers that I was interacting with felt that you know uh, Velez had 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 won the fight, but had suffered once again with. Being a you know a fighter who uh, you know doesn't have that A level status, 
And unfortunately, you know, the prospects are always going to get the favourable decisions. So, so uh, very unlucky fighter as well, Mike. So I think top the, the, the way top rank are looking at it is that Oscar Valdez to come up, acclimate himself against. But it's a it's a it's not an easy fight for Valdez moving up in his third fight at a different higher weight category, especially after being dropped and, and not looking too good in his, in, his, in his previous fight as well, Mike. So that's a that's a very good competitive fight. I would I would probably lean to, to, to Valdez on points, Mike. But um, Valdez is definitely capable of giving him trouble. Valdez has just lost that ability, Mike. The, the ability that, that he showed at times to punch on the fly, in which he had a great deal of success. He, he has lost that ability. He gets into wars too much. He loses his foot traction and he doesn't pivot off that well. So he, he needs to box against a puncher. And I think that's what the Rhinoceros will 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 try and sort of infiltrate into him. That he's gonna he's up against a potentially a dangerous and it's a Mexican Puerto Rican showdown. So so Velez and will definitely be up for this fight as well to cause an upset. So um yeah, I, I would lean to Valdez on points, but I, I give him credit, mate. It's it's a good test at a new weight as well. So I think it's a good fight for for, for boxing fans to have in this lockdown period. Um, I, I'll go to you, Daniel. Uh, uh, um, since Gus kind of got a gave a, a really extended breakdown of, of of Valdez and of the of Oscar Valdez fight, I'll leave the Victor Ortiz fight. Uh, uh, up to you. Your thoughts on uh, Ortiz and his fight against Samuel Vargas, or Sammy Vargas, excuse me. It's a good, it's a good test for Virgil. It's a really, really good test for Virgil. Uh, we have to see a certain point whether he's good, and uh, particularly in welterweight, where you know it's currently stacked right now. Make a lot of sense for him making fights. Same works as a decent opponent to have. <clears throat> we know he's been tested, but now it's time for him to prove it up. We, like I mentioned before, when we talked about when we talked about Ryan Garcia, if he does well and the Pember goes through, if it goes through, Virgil plans to be ready. So it's trying to keep him now more active. And build up his resume because I think almost all of us were in agreement at a certain point. Last time, I think we all taught that if it, out of the prospects that Golden Boy has to be the better prospect. Oh, no doubt about it. Probably man. has more upside by now. So, this is a good. Oh, no, no doubt about it. In, yeah. in my, in so my mind, old, Daniel, um, and Virgil is more than Ortiz, ready. And it's Ortiz and it's uh, Rashidi Ellis, in my opinion. Dennis, Dennis Ryan Garcia. Yeah, but that's that's the main thing to me. Like he has to show it now, and especially in this division because there's not a lot of fights he can get at this division, given the circumstances. Like the only fight right now, I start pretty soon. I think with a couple of cards, but the only fight of significance right now that you could eye yourself. Finn, as a welterweight with the people that are currently running is Bud. And if you try to position yourself to fight Bud, she'll improve because of in a lot of people's lists, he is the top welterweight of the division. A good amount of people still have Errol Spence. He has to prove himself when it comes into the whole how he's going to look after the accident. But that should be very, very glad to see Virgil be the one to step up and actually be the first person to highlight and go the way. Hopefully, we see him this year. 
And I think we're going to uh, uh, start to shut things down on that note. I mentioned where you can um, follow Gail if you want to uh, uh, talk about boxing or anything else. Um, since this has been a while since you've been on, Gus, I'll go to you for those who want to uh, talk uh, the sweet science or want to talk music. I know you do a lot of uh, work uh, discussing and detailing music uh, on the side. Uh, for those who want to talk boxing, for those who want to talk music, um, let the folks know where they can find you. Yeah, Mike, thanks. Uh, pleasure being on again. Yeah, corruption in boxing and the best betting tip for that, Victor, for that um, Ortiz and uh, Samuel Vargas, I'd go for a knockout between rounds one and three for Ortiz. Uh, I think you can get, I think you can get very, very good odds for that. Well, definitely between one and six if you want to stretch it a little bit, but I think that's going to be a destruction. And hopefully, you know, um, Errol Sprentz, Terence Crawford, Sean Porter, Manny Pacquiao. Thank you very much for your service, but I want to see Virgil Ortiz, Jeron Boots, and his. that's the fight for me. Don't know when that's going to happen, but that that's the best two for me. Uh, they are the future, no doubt, in the welterweight div division. Um, Ortiz is already talking about uh, eventually wanting to fight uh, uh, Danny Garcia, uh, 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 down the road, but you're you're absolutely right. Those are I would throw Ellis in there as well, but I would put him. I would I would put him a little bit behind uh, Boots Ennis. The problem is with Ellis is that um, Golden Boy is just doing a piss poor job of, of of promoting him. I just have to say it. They don't feature him enough. They don't put him with anybody really tough that that can that can test him. It's just. Um, egregious the way they've uh, uh, yeah. focused on both Ortiz and Garcia and haven't given um, Rashidi Ellis not a, enough shine, who I think is a very good uh, whilst away uh, prospect from the New England uh, um, area. Um, I'll go to you, Daniel, for those who want to talk the sweet science, for those who want to talk the NBA, especially when it comes to Miami Heat. And given that the um, season is about to pick back up, what, August or later on this month, the 31st of July, um, let the folks know where they can find you. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so you can find me on Twitter at rockstarnet or WKUZ99. Like I said, with uh, the NBA coming up, the big thing that's coming into it right now with the Heat is uh, what's going to happen with Jimmy? He has petitioned to have his name. Uh, be blank in the jerseys what the initiative of the NBA is doing this year saying earlier that the NBA denied it that has been refuted and now we need to see what's going what's going on in that area but we'll see how the season goes as long as it lasts because unfortunately this thing is still in Florida yeah in Florida uh, particularly Central and South Florida is really becoming the epicenter of this uh, COVID-19 um, um, virus. And yeah, that's um, really unfortunate. And I'm wondering how they're gonna sustain um, keeping everyone um, safe uh, uh, down there and given the rising numbers in that state, not just the rising number in that state, but the fool hardiness and the ridiculousness of the governor down there who would, I don't know what, what, the, what the hell he's doing. Um, for those who want to talk boxing, for those who want to talk music, fitness with me, you know what it is on Twitter, Brother JR at Brother JR76. Um, as I stated earlier in the show, for the time being, if you want to check out all things regarding Pound for Pound Box Report, um, you can check, look at, look for the blog page, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. As I said, you can check the top right of the blog page. You can find where to find us all over social media, where to find the podcast, where you can donate. The links to my online coaching page and also if you want to check i'm also a uh a writer for three kings boxing you can check out my work there on three kingsboxing.com um i submitted something earlier today um you may be interested in this gus but the uh julio cesar martinez his bout with um uh, mcwilliams on royo has been postponed Ooh. for the time being as okay. uh as uh, Martinez has come down with a throat infection, they hope hopefully uh, is postponed for now. They hopefully will try to make up, have a makeup date uh, uh, for that bout um, in September. Um, kind of a missed opportunity for Martinez. 
yeah. first U.S. card for the zone. He was going to be the headliner, and um, for me, it was going to be a setup for what um, Eddie Reynoso and Eddie Hearn hopes to be a big 2021, which would include him trying to unify possibly against Muthalane and then possibly move up to 115 pounds. They're already talking about him moving up and fighting the likes of Estrada and the, like, the likes of uh, Choco Latito. So they got big plans for him. And this would have been the jump off uh, uh, for all of that. So, yeah, um, I want to thank uh, want to thank Gail, who joined us earlier. I want to thank Gus from Corruption and Boxing, Daniel from The Inscriber. I am your host, Michael. This has been episode 292 of the Pound for Pound Box Report. Um, on the next episode, will we do a recap of of Ortiz Vargas? We will do a recap of Valdez and, and Jason Velez, and we will do a preview of. Excuse me, right quick. We will do a preview of. Uh, maybe take some take a look at some fights happening in the UK. Um, Sam Megating, he's fighting over in the UK. Uh, uh, James Tennyson uh, fighting Gavin Gwynn fighting that fight's happening in Essex over on Sky the Zone. Um, and on the seventh, we mentioned Terry Harper, and we were, when we were talking about Michaela Mayer, I would love to see her Harper fight Michaela Mayer. Um, that Harper Natasha Jonas fight that's going to be happening on August seventh. We're going to do a preview um, of that fight as well. Very good uh, uh, women's bout. Terry Harper, very good uh, champion WBC. Uh, version at 130 pounds. So we'll do a preview of those fights again. I want to thank Gus for joining us. I want to thank Daniel for joining me. I am your host, Michael. Episode 292 of uh, 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 Pound for Pound Box Report. Um, everybody have a good evening, uh, good night, and um, a rest in power to, rest in power to, um, excuse me right quick, rest in power to Oh, my name escapes me, escapes me, escapes me, escapes me, escapes me, excuse me right quick. Rest in power to uh, uh, Congressman John Lewis. Rest in power to Reverend C.T. Vivian, who passed away on July 17th, two pioneers, uh, particularly when it came to the issue of civil rights. So uh, rest in peace to those two legends. So episode 292 of Pound for Pound Box Report. See you next time. Everyone have a good evening. Good night.